As a teenager, I was kicked out of my home because of false rumours spread by my sister. Now that I have achieved success, my parents, who abandoned me, are asking for financial support. I was 16 when my life crumbled beneath me. Up until that point, I'd been your average teenager, dealing with the usual high school drama, stressing over grades, and trying to figure out my future. But what I didn't realise was that my biggest challenge wouldn't come from school or friends, but from the very people who were supposed to love me unconditionally. My family. My sister, Emily, was two years younger than me. She was the golden child, the one who could do no wrong. With her big blue eyes and innocent smile, she had our parents wrapped around her finger from the moment she was born. Meanwhile, I was the one who had to prove myself over and over again, always falling short in their eyes. If Emily got a B on a test, it was celebrated with ice cream. If I got an A, it was met with a reminder that I should aim for an A plus next time. I didn't resent Emily for it, at least not at first. I figured it was just the way things were. She was younger, more charming, and I was the older one who should know better. But everything changed one fateful afternoon when I came home from school to find my mum waiting for me in the living room, her arms crossed and a look on her face that could only mean trouble. Sit down, she ordered, her voice colder than I'd ever heard it. I obeyed, my stomach churning with anxiety. Dad stood behind her, his face an unreadable mask. What's going on? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Don't play dumb, she snapped. We know what you've been doing. My mind raced, trying to figure out what she was talking about. I hadn't done anything wrong, at least nothing that would warrant this kind of reaction. We found the money you stole, Dad said, his voice gruff, and we know about the cheating. What? I gasped, genuinely shocked. I didn't steal anything, and I've never cheated in my life. But my protests fell on deaf ears. Mum held up a stack of crumpled bills, money that had supposedly gone missing from Dad's wallet over the past few weeks. I hadn't taken it, but someone had stashed it in my room, hidden under my mattress, where I never would have found it if they hadn't gone looking. And the cheating? I asked, my heart pounding. Where did that come from? Mum's lips tightened into a thin line. Emily told us everything, she said. She saw you copying answers during your last exam and she overheard you bragging about it to your friends. I felt like the ground had been pulled out from under me. Emily? My sister? The one person I thought I could trust? It didn't make any sense. I turned to her, but she wouldn't meet my eyes. She was standing in the doorway, looking down at the floor, her expression blank. Emily, tell them the truth, I pleaded. I didn't do any of this. But she remained silent and that silence was enough to seal my fate. Dad's voice cut through the air like a knife. Pack your things, he said. You're leaving. For a moment, I thought I must have misheard him. What? I whispered, my throat dry. You're no longer welcome in this house, Mom said, her voice devoid of any warmth or love. You've disgraced this family enough. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. They were kicking me out, over lies. I looked at them, searching for any sign that this was some kind of twisted joke, but their expressions were stony. They meant every word. You can't do this, I said, my voice trembling. Where am I supposed to go? That's your problem, Dad replied, turning his back on me. We've had enough of your lies. I looked at Emily one last time, hoping she would speak up, that she would tell them the truth, but she just stood there, silent and unmoving. With tears streaming down my face, I went to my room and packed a small bag with whatever I could grab. My hands were shaking so badly that I could barely zip it up. I felt like I was in a nightmare, but no matter how many times I pinched myself, I couldn't wake up. When I walked out of the house, no one said a word. My parents didn't look at me, and Emily had disappeared, probably hiding in her room where she didn't have to face what she'd done. I stood on the porch for a moment, hoping against hope that someone would come after me, that they'd realize their mistake and tell me to come back inside. But the door remained closed. I had nowhere to go. My friends were all just kids like me, living under their parents' roofs, and I was too ashamed to ask any of them for help. So I walked. I walked until my feet were blistered and the sun had set, and then I kept walking, 
trying to figure out what I'd done to deserve this. Eventually, I ended up at a park, exhausted and completely drained. I found a bench and curled up on it. My bag clutched to my chest and cried until there were no tears left. The night was cold and the stars above seemed indifferent to my suffering. I had never felt so alone in my life. I stayed in that park until dawn, when the world started waking up around me. People began to fill the streets, heading off to work or school, oblivious to the homeless teenager sitting on a bench, trying to make sense of the wreckage that had become their life. As the sun rose higher in the sky, I realized that I had a choice to make. I could either give up and let the darkness swallow me whole, or I could find a way to survive. I chose the latter, not because I had any great hope for the future, but because I was too stubborn to let my sister and my parents win. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I swore to myself that I would get through this, and one day I would make them see just how wrong they were. But that day was a long way off. First, I had to survive. The days that followed were a blur of exhaustion, fear, and a grim determination that kept me moving forward, even when my body begged me to stop. The little money I had on me didn't last long, just enough for a few cheap meals and a night at a rundown motel where I could shower and get a few hours of sleep without worrying about my safety. When the money ran out, I found myself back on the streets. I didn't know where else to go, so I returned to the park where I had spent my first night. During the day, I wandered through the city, keeping an eye out for job postings and places where I could rest without drawing too much attention. I learned to avoid the areas where the police were likely to patrol, knowing that if they found out I was a minor with no home, I'd end up in the system. I didn't trust that any foster home would be better than the life I'd just been thrown out of. It wasn't long before hunger became my constant companion, gnawing at my insides like a living thing. I quickly realised that finding a job wasn't going to be as easy as I had hoped. Most places wouldn't even look at me without a high school diploma, and those that did were suspicious of my lack of an address or phone number. I lied and said I was staying with friends, hoping it would buy me some time, but the rejections kept piling up. After a few more nights of sleeping on benches and scrounging for food, I knew I needed help. Swallowing my pride, I went to a local shelter, a small place that was barely noticeable unless you were looking for it. The shelter was crowded with people from all walks of life, some who had been on the streets for years, others who had only recently fallen on hard times. It was a sobering experience, seeing how easily life could go from normal to desperate. The shelter staff asked a lot of questions, how I ended up there, if I had any family I could contact, but I kept my answers vague. I wasn't ready to talk about what had happened, and I didn't want them to call my parents. The last thing I needed was to be sent back to the place that had thrown me away like garbage. Despite the rough conditions, the shelter provided some stability. They had a few basic rules, no drugs, no fighting, and everyone had to be out during the day. But they offered food, a place to sleep, and even some resources for people trying to get back on their feet. I took full advantage of everything they offered especially the job board they kept updated with any opportunities they could find. I picked up whatever work I could, dishwashing, cleaning, even a few hours at a local grocery store bagging groceries. It wasn't much, but it was enough to keep me going, enough to save up a little money for bus fare and a meal that didn't come from a dumpster. I also made sure to stay in school, though it was hard. Without a permanent address, I couldn't officially enrol but I was able to sit in on classes at a nearby public high school where the teachers didn't ask too many questions. I kept my head down and focused on my studies, knowing that education was my only ticket out of this mess. It wasn't easy. There were days when I thought I wouldn't make it, when the weight of everything seemed too much to bear. But every time I felt like giving up, I remembered the look on my parents' faces as they threw me out of the house. The way my sister had stood there, silent and complicit in my downfall. That anger fueled me, drove me to keep pushing forward, no matter how hard it got. One day, as I was flipping through the job board at the shelter, something caught my eye, a flyer for a scholarship programme. It was for students who had faced significant hardships, but had shown determination to succeed. The deadline was fast approaching, 
and the requirements were tough, but I knew I had to try. I spent every spare moment working on my application, writing and rewriting my essay until my eyes blurred from exhaustion. I poured my heart into that essay, detailing the challenges I had faced and the dreams I still clung to despite everything. I didn't sugarcoat anything. I was honest about my situation, about the pain and the betrayal that had led me to this point. But I also wrote about my determination to rise above it, to prove that I was worth more than the lies my sister had spread. Submitting that application felt like sending a piece of my soul out into the world. I didn't know if it would be enough, but it was all I had left to give. The waiting was agonizing. Every day, I checked the mail at the shelter, hoping for some word, some sign that my efforts hadn't been in vain. The other people there didn't understand why I was so fixated on it. They were just trying to get through the day, one moment at a time. But for me, that scholarship represented hope, a chance to escape the cycle of poverty and despair that threatened to consume me. When the letter finally came, I was too afraid to open it at first. My hands shook as I tore the envelope open, my heart pounding in my chest. The first few words blurred together and I had to force myself to slow down, to read each sentence carefully. I had been accepted. I couldn't believe it. After everything I had been through, someone had seen my potential, had believed in me enough to give me this opportunity. The scholarship wasn't just a financial lifeline, it was validation, proof that I wasn't defined by the lies that had ruined my life. With the scholarship, I was able to enrol in a university, something I had once thought would be impossible. The transition wasn't easy. I had to adjust to a new environment, deal with the lingering trauma of my past, and keep up with the rigorous demands of my coursework. But I thrived, driven by the knowledge that this was my second chance, a chance that I couldn't afford to waste. I found a part-time job on campus, enough to cover my basic needs, and threw myself into my studies. I majored in business, determined to build a future where I would never have to rely on anyone else again. The more I learned, the more I realized how much I had been underestimated, not just by my family, but by everyone who had ever looked at me and seen only a homeless kid with no prospects. As the years passed, I started to build a new life for myself. I made friends who supported me, who saw me for who I really was, not the person my sister had painted me as. I formed connections with professors who became mentors, guiding me as I navigated the complexities of my education and career. And slowly but surely, I began to find success. It didn't happen overnight, but with every step forward, I felt the weight of my past lift a little more. I was no longer that scared, broken teenager sleeping on a park bench. I was someone with a future, someone with the power to shape their own destiny. But even as I achieved more than I ever thought possible, the shadow of my family's betrayal lingered in the back of my mind. I wondered if they ever thought about me, if they regretted what they had done. Part of me wanted to reach out, to tell them about everything I had accomplished, to show them that I had made it despite their attempts to destroy me. But another part of me, the part that still felt the sting of their rejection, wasn't sure I could ever forgive them. It wasn't until I received an unexpected message that I realized I might have to confront those feelings sooner than I had planned. The past I had tried so hard to escape was about to come crashing back into my life and I would have to decide once and for all whether I was ready to face it. Years had passed since the night I was thrown out of my parents' home. In that time, I'd managed to build the life I once thought was out of reach. University had been my salvation, a place where I could reinvent myself, where no one knew about the lies that had nearly destroyed me. I graduated with honours, landing a job at a well-respected company right out of school. From there, I climbed the corporate ladder, not because of any innate talent or luck, but because I worked harder than anyone else. Every promotion, every accolade was another victory, another way of proving that I was more than the girl my parents had cast aside. My career took off. I rose through the ranks, eventually landing a position as a senior executive at a major firm. My success didn't come without sacrifice. I worked long hours, often late into the night, driven by a relentless desire to secure my future. The past still haunted me, but it also fueled me, pushing me to heights I hadn't even dreamed of as a teenager. As my career flourished, 
so did my personal life. I built a new family, a close-knit group of friends who supported me through the highs and lows. They knew bits and pieces of my story, but I never fully opened up about what had happened with my parents. It was too painful, too raw, even after all these years. I focused on the present, on the life I was building, rather than the life I had left behind. But the past has a way of creeping up on you, even when you think you've buried it for good. One day, I received an email that I almost dismissed as spam. It was from a lawyer in my hometown, someone I didn't recognise, asking for a meeting. Curiosity got the better of me, and I opened the message, only to find out that my parents were trying to reach me. My heart skipped a beat as I read the lawyer's carefully worded request for a conversation regarding family matters. It was vague, but the implications were clear. They needed something from me. I hadn't heard from my parents since the day they kicked me out. Not a single word. Not even when I started making a name for myself in the business world. Part of me had always wondered if they kept tabs on me, if they knew how far I'd come. But I never expected them to reach out after all these years. I sat staring at the email for what felt like an eternity, my mind racing. A part of me wanted to delete it and pretend I'd never seen it. But another part, the part that still bore the scars of their betrayal, wanted to know why they were reaching out now. What could possibly have changed after all this time? Against my better judgment, I responded, agreeing to meet with the lawyer. I needed to know what they wanted, and more importantly, I needed to confront the people who had abandoned me when I was at my lowest. The meeting was scheduled for the following week. I arrived at the lawyer's office with a mixture of dread and anticipation, my stomach in knots. The waiting room was quiet, sterile, the kind of place where important, life-altering conversations happened. I was greeted by a middle-aged man with kind eyes and a firm handshake. He introduced himself as Mr Jensen and led me to a small conference room where we could speak privately. Thank you for coming, he said as we sat down. I understand this must be difficult for you. You could say that, I replied, keeping my tone neutral. So, what's this about? He hesitated, choosing his words carefully. Your parents have fallen on hard times. They've lost a significant portion of their savings due to some unfortunate investments and poor financial management. They reached out to me because they've heard about your success and were hoping to reconnect. I felt a bitter laugh rise in my throat, but managed to suppress it. Reconnect? That was rich. And by reconnect, you mean they want money? Mr. Jensen didn't flinch. They're in a difficult situation. They've asked if you would be willing to assist them financially. For a moment, I couldn't speak. The audacity of it all was staggering. My parents, who had kicked me out without a second thought, who had believed my sister's lies over my truth, were now asking for my help because they were broke. It was almost too absurd to be real. And what makes them think I'd be interested in helping them? I asked, my voice cold. He sighed, looking genuinely uncomfortable. They're your parents. I think they're hoping that despite everything, you might still feel some obligation toward them. Obligation? The word hung in the air like a bad smell. Did they really think I owed them something after all they had done? After they had turned their backs on me when I needed them most? I leaned back in my chair, my mind a whirlwind of conflicting emotions. On one hand, I was furious. How dare they come to me now after all these years asking for money as if we were a family again? On the other hand, I felt a twinge of something I hadn't expected. Pity. I imagined them sitting in their home, the walls closing in on them as they realised how wrong they had been. How alone they were now that their golden child, Emily, had moved on with her life leaving them to deal with the consequences of their own actions. What about my sister? I asked, my voice sharper than I intended. Isn't she their golden child? Why can't she help them? Mr Jensen hesitated. I'm not fully aware of the details, but from what I understand, your sister is no longer in regular contact with them. She moved out of state some time ago and hasn't been very responsive to their attempts to reach her. So, Emily had finally distanced herself from them. I wondered what had happened. Had she finally grown tired of their favouritism? Or had they turned on her the way they had turned on me? The thought gave me little comfort. I sat there grappling with my emotions. 
I wanted to tell Mr. Jensen to go back to my parents and tell them exactly where they could shove their request. But another part of me, the part that had spent years trying to be the bigger person, hesitated. What would they need? I asked, my voice flat. How much? He pulled out a folder and slid it across the table to me. These are their financial records. As you can see, they're in quite a bit of debt. They're hoping you might be able to help them with the mortgage, utilities, and basic living expenses. I glanced at the numbers, my heart hardening with every page I turned. They were in deep, deeper than I had imagined. A lifetime of bad decisions had finally caught up with them, and now they wanted me to bail them out. Why should I help them? I asked, closing the folder and looking Mr. Jensen in the eye. They threw me out like I was nothing. They didn't care if I lived or died. Now they need me, and I'm just supposed to forget everything they did. He nodded, understanding the weight of my words. You're under no obligation to help them, but sometimes helping others, especially those who have wronged us, can bring closure. It can be a way to take back control, to show that you've risen above the hurt they caused. His words struck a chord in me. Was this really about money? Or was it about something deeper? Was this my chance to finally close the door on the past, to prove to myself that I was stronger than the pain they had inflicted on me? I didn't answer immediately. Instead, I told Mr. Jensen I needed time to think about it, and he agreed to give me as much as I needed. We shook hands, and I left the office, my mind a tangled mess of emotions. As I walked through the bustling city streets, I thought about the life I had built, I thought about the people who had helped me along the way, the mentors who had seen something in me when no one else did, the friends who had become my new family. I thought about how far I had come, from that scared teenager sleeping on a park bench to a successful executive with the power to help or reject the very people who had tried to break me. The power was mine now, and with it came the responsibility to decide how I wanted to use it. Did I want revenge? Or did I want to show that I had moved beyond the petty, cruel world they had once forced me to live in? That night I couldn't sleep. I kept turning over the situation in my mind, weighing the pros and cons, trying to figure out what would bring me the most peace. It was a decision that would define not just my relationship with my parents, but the way I saw myself. When dawn broke, I finally had my answer. It wasn't the one I had expected, but it felt right. It felt like the first real step toward healing a wound that had festered for far too long. I knew what I had to do. The next morning, I found myself standing outside the house where I had spent the first 16 years of my life. The house looked smaller than I remembered, worn down by time and neglect. The garden, once meticulously maintained by my mother, was now overgrown with weeds. The paint was peeling and the windows were dull as if they hadn't been cleaned in years. It was a far cry from the home I had left behind, and seeing it like this stirred a mix of emotions within me, nostalgia, anger, and a sadness I hadn't expected. I took a deep breath and knocked on the door. For a moment, I considered turning around and walking away, but I had come too far to back out now. The door creaked open, and my mother stood before me, her face a mask of shock and something that looked almost like fear. Hi, Mum, I said, my voice steady despite the turmoil inside me. She stared at me as if she was seeing a ghost. You, you came, she stammered, her eyes wide. Mr. Jensen told me what's going on, I replied, cutting to the chase. I'm here to talk. She stepped aside, allowing me to enter. The inside of the house was as run down as the outside. Dust coated the furniture, and the once vibrant wallpaper had faded to a dull, lifeless colour. The house felt as empty as I had felt all those years ago when they turned their backs on me. My father was sitting in his old armchair, but he stood up the moment he saw me, his expression a mixture of guilt and something else I couldn't quite place. Dad, I greeted him, trying to keep my voice neutral. He nodded, his eyes filled with a sadness I'd never seen before. It's good to see you, kid, he said, his voice gruff. I'm not a kid anymore, I replied unable to keep the edge out of my voice. I haven't been for a long time. There was an awkward silence as we stood there, the weight of the years between us hanging in the air. 
I had imagined this moment so many times, but now that it was here, I didn't know where to begin. So many things had been left unsaid, so many wounds left to fester. Can we sit down? I asked, finally breaking the silence. They both nodded, and we moved to the living room. I chose the chair furthest from them, needing the distance to keep my emotions in check. They sat on the couch close to each other, as if they could find strength in their shared misery. Why now? I asked, looking directly at them. Why reach out after all this time? My mother looked down at her hands, which were clasped tightly in her lap. My father sighed, running a hand through his thinning hair. We made mistakes, he said finally, his voice heavy. Big ones. We thought we were doing the right thing at the time, but we were wrong. We were so wrong. I clenched my jaw, trying to keep the anger at bay. You didn't just make mistakes, you destroyed me. You believed Emily's lies without even asking for my side. You threw me out with nothing, and you never looked back. I had to fight for everything I have now because of what you did. Tears welled up in my mother's eyes. We were too proud, she whispered. Too stubborn to admit we might have been wrong, and by the time we realized what we'd done, it was too late. You were gone. You could have reached out, I said, my voice shaking with the effort to remain calm. But you didn't. Not until now, when you need something from me. We didn't know how, my father admitted. We were ashamed. We thought you'd hate us. I did hate you, I said, the words coming out before I could stop them. For a long time, I hated you both. But mostly, I hated Emily. She ruined my life, and you let her. There was a long pause before my mother spoke again. We haven't heard from Emily in years, she said her voice trembling. She left not long after you did. She went to college, got married and moved away. We tried to stay in touch, but she, she wanted nothing to do with us. A bitter laugh escaped my lips. So she abandoned you too, isn't that ironic? My father flinched at my words, but he didn't argue. We deserve that, he said quietly. We deserve worse for what we did to you. I took a deep breath, trying to steady my emotions. I didn't come here to punish you, I said, surprising myself with how true the words felt. I came because I needed to understand why you did what you did, and I needed to decide if I could help you. My mother looked up, hope flickering in her eyes. We're so sorry, she said, tears streaming down her face. We were wrong, so wrong. We know we can't undo the past, but if there's any chance, if you could find it in your heart to forgive us, Forgive you? I repeated, the word tasting strange in my mouth. I don't know if I can do that. Not yet. Maybe not ever. But I'm willing to try. For my own sake as much as yours. My father nodded, his eyes brimming with tears of his own. That's more than we deserve. I didn't respond immediately. Instead, I reached into my bag and pulled out a folder. These are some financial arrangements I've made for you, I said, sliding the folder across the table. I'll help you with the mortgage and the essentials. But this isn't about buying your way back into my life. This is about giving all of us a chance to move forward. They looked at the folder, then back at me, stunned. We can't take your money, my mother protested weakly. Not after everything. You can, I interrupted, my voice firm. And you will, because this is me taking control of my life, of my story. This is me saying that you don't get to define who I am anymore. I do. Tears streamed down my mother's face as she reached out, but I held up a hand, stopping her. I'm not ready for anything more than this right now, I said, my voice softer but still resolute. I need time. Time to process everything to figure out if there's a way forward for us, but this, this is a start. They both nodded, understanding the boundaries I was setting. For the first time, I saw true remorse in their eyes, a recognition of the pain they had caused and the person I had become despite it. I'm proud of you, my father said quietly, his voice thick with emotion. Not because of your success, but because of your strength. We see that now, even if we didn't before. The words hit me harder than I expected. I had waited years to hear something like that from him, but now that I had, it felt like a bittersweet victory. I nodded, accepting the sentiment. 
but not allowing it to soften the resolve I had built within myself. I need to go, I said, standing up. This is a lot to process. My mother stood as well, looking at me with a mix of gratitude and sorrow. Thank you, she whispered, for giving us a chance. We won't waste it, I promise. I didn't say anything as I left. I wasn't ready to make promises of my own. The drive back to the city was long and quiet, giving me plenty of time to reflect on everything that had happened. I had faced my past, confronted the people who had hurt me most, and made a decision that felt right, even if it wasn't easy. As I pulled into my driveway, I felt a sense of closure that had eluded me for years. The anger and pain that had driven me for so long were still there, but they no longer consumed me. I had taken control of my life, my story, and in doing so, I had begun to heal. Back in my apartment, I sat down and let out a long breath. The weight I had carried for so long was still there, but it was lighter now, more manageable. I had faced my demons, and though the road ahead was still uncertain, I knew I had the strength to walk it. As I settled into the familiar comfort of my home, I realised that this was just the beginning of a new chapter. My past had shaped me, but it didn't define me. I was more than the girl who had been kicked out of her home. I was someone who had risen above it, who had found success and peace on my own terms. And that, I realised, was enough. For now, it was enough. Thank you for reading my story. It wasn't an easy one to tell, but I'm glad I did. Life is complicated, and sometimes the choices we make aren't black and white. I'd love to hear your thoughts. What would you have done in my shoes? Have you ever had to face someone who wronged you and decide whether to forgive them? Let's talk about it.